Hey everyone, people don't realize that Apple's remote management lock bricks and kills potentially millions of perfectly good Apple devices, easily as many as activation lock, and in a lot of ways it's actually worse than activation lock because remote management is very hard to detect and how it behaves is far less straightforward. So most people have heard about activation lock because Apple promotes it, but what the heck is this remote management lock? To start, let's take a step further back and ask, what is remote management? Well, it's a general term for a system that lets organizations manage their devices. Basically, when you have an institution that uses a large number of phones, tablets, and laptops, it's useful to have some way to deploy software to those devices, to enforce policies so users can't do things that are forbidden, to customize the interface, to track where a device is at the moment, to see what your users are doing on the internet, to remote wipe or brick the device. Remote management can give a company a huge amount of control over their devices and their employees' use of those devices. Remote management exists for all kinds of platforms and brands, but here we're going to focus on Apple. Some terms related to remote management are DEP, D-E-P, Device Enrollment Program, and MDM, Mobile Device Management, and there are a lot of other acronyms as well. It's a very acronym-happy technology. Remote management generally keeps track of devices by the serial number, and the serial of the device gets entered into the admin tool by the administrator. When the device's serial has been set up, and then that new device connects to Wi-Fi, the device checks with relevant Apple servers and essentially asks, hey, am I a managed device? And if the Apple server says yes, then Apple passes it on to the management server, and the management is enforced on that device based on a profile set up for it, and all of the profile settings and software comes down. If it's not a managed device, then the user goes about their business setting it up and using it just like they bought a personal device at the Apple Store. Apple's main administrative tool is called Apple Business Manager and also Apple School Manager for schools. This is an administrative tool where computers and accounts are enrolled and disenrolled into management. Once a device is designated as managed, then an MDM profile can be assigned. An MDM, Mobile Device Manager, is an additional software tool from Apple Business Manager. It's a separate component that deploys the policy and basically any of the management features I mentioned earlier. Apple has an MDM called Apple Business Essentials, but there are many other third-party MDMs, including a popular one you can see here called Jamf, J-A-M-F. Not sure how to pronounce that. So, for instance, if a company gets a new employee out in the field, an IT department can drop ship a new laptop to that employee from a vendor, enter that computer's serial number or even the invoice number into Apple Business Manager, then assign an MDM profile, and then when the new employee connects to Wi-Fi and logs in, their profile comes down and their computer is exactly as it needs to be in order to function within the company, and the company has oversight of that computer. Pretty cool, actually, and very functional. If you're in the Windows world, you might see a parallel to the group policy tool. I'm a former MCSE, so I think of it a lot like group policy. So what's the problem then? It sounds like a pretty great thing actually, doesn't it? I mean, amazing technology? It makes a lot of sense for organizations to keep their users and devices in line. You can't blame them for wanting that. Well, the problem starts with the fact that after the computer's serial number has been set up, after that computer connects to Wi-Fi, then after you get the notification of remote management and click Next, there is a login prompt. When that brand new computer that has been registered with remote management arrives, the company employee powers it on and enters the Wi-Fi info and that handshake with Apple happens, the next thing is that the user must log into the company. If that user has the login as an employee would, then that's great. Everything goes as planned. But if a user of the computer doesn't have the login, the computer just sits there. You cannot get past the login. You're stuck. It's effectively bricked. So I'll get right to the issue. When government, academic institutions, and corporations decide to dump thousands of computers to recyclers or other entities when they're done with them, they too often fail to deregister managed devices from the management tool. Inevitably, they forget, or they're too lazy, or they just assume they'll get destroyed so they don't bother, or whatever. The tools are cumbersome and don't exactly help. But reality is that millions of Apple iPhones, iPads, and MacBooks that are perfectly legitimate getting to recyclers or other entities, they haven't been removed from management. And so when the new owner, whoever that is, steps through the startup process, enters Wi-Fi information, the handshake happens and they get that login, which they don't have, and the device is bricked. 
Unlike activation lock, remote management is not meant to be a security measure. It's not meant to be a lock. That's why I put lock in quotes in the thumbnail. The Apple Terms of Service Agreement states clearly that the institution using these tools must deregister all devices before disposal, but obviously that's not enforced. I've even talked to school administrators whose Apple reps told them not to bother deregistering if they think it takes too much time out of their day. So all these devices end up bricked, literally millions of them, and they get out into the world. And again, they're legitimately passed on by the institutions. It's not like they're stolen or something. Recyclers who are lucky to get donations, lucky to have customers, don't usually have the leverage to push back and ask them to disenroll. Recyclers often don't even know they're managed before they pass them on to other recyclers or other parties. I've personally bought thousands of managed devices from recyclers who had no idea they were managed. And I can tell you that I've known dozens of other refurbishers that have had exactly the same experience. You might say, well, but oh, don't worry, Apple will make this right, right? If you just let them know there's been a little snag in their system, they'll fix it because they want the computer to be reused. Uh, yeah, no. Actually, Apple states explicitly that they won't do a thing about remote management, which hilariously is even harsher than their approach to activation lock, which is supposed to be a lock and an anti-theft measure. As terrible as activation lock is, and as many devices as it destroys, at least there is a procedure, at least there is a one in a thousand chance that Apple might unlock your device. But with remote management, that's where they draw the line. Apple just says no. So John, you ask, just do like Apple says to do on their webpage. The obvious thing is for the recycler that receives a thousand managed iPhones to ask the institution to deregister them. Well, sir, yeah, but there are a lot of ifs in that idea. First, you're assuming that the recycler even powers on the devices and evaluates them before they pass them on to the next party. If they don't, or if they receive them from another recycler themselves, then they have no leverage whatsoever to ask the original donating institution to deregister. Power dynamics in the recycling world are different than in the typical customer-vendor relationship that you might imagine, and often the institutions simply don't care or will not respond to requests. Additionally, even if the donating institution is sympathetic and decides wholeheartedly to help, it's an absolutely horrific situation and requires tons of work, which often can't even be financially justified. Hold on to your seat. This is what needs to happen in that scenario. First step, let's say a recycler gets a couple pallets of MacBooks. The recycler's goal is to make a list of serial numbers that are managed for the institution to take out of their system, right? Sounds straightforward, but it's actually really difficult. To even know that a device is managed, you need to put a fresh install of the operating system on it, then walk through to the Wi-Fi step of the system setup. If it's managed, you see the managed notification. So if you have a thousand devices, you need to install the operating system on a thousand devices. That's also assuming the devices are working and don't need repair. If they need repair, you have to repair them, then install the OS and then see if it's managed. Let's say at the end of the day, 500 of the thousand turn out to be managed. So you make a spreadsheet and give that list of serials to the donating institution. Next, the institution has to go down the list and remove all the devices. I've been told by a dozen administrators that management tools are cumbersome and do not let you do this in an especially straightforward or logical manner, causing a lot of work on their end. Okay, next step. So management has been removed from the 500 at the server level, so we're done, right? Uh, no, actually, because the thing is, the OS installs on the 500 devices that turned out to be managed, well, they're actually still infected by management as they sit. Those devices are still bricked. So for the recycler to verify the devices are no longer registered at the server level, they must be wiped yet again, and the OS must be installed yet again. If they finally connect to Wi-Fi but don't get the management prompt, then you know the device is good. But inevitably, some still aren't because people make mistakes, and the process must be repeated until every last one is verified. Because if you sell these machines and a managed device gets to an end user and is bricked, that's a terrible user experience, and as a vendor, you're in bad shape. So once all the devices are verified not managed, you're finally done, right? Well, kind of, but I don't know. Is this really a victory? Is this really a viable path to take every time you want to repair and refurbish Apple products? 
the recycler had to put three people on this project for a few days. It involved 1,500 operating system installs, possibly dozens or hundreds of repairs, and it's all a huge, huge, huge amount of labor. These could be near new devices that are definitely worth it, but they could also be more typical low value devices and the high cost of labor involved might make this an unprofitable venture. As you can guess, most recyclers simply don't have the time and decide to scrap managed devices instead. And to make it worse, this epidemic of millions of random devices being remote managed makes it absolutely mandatory to check for management when refurbishing Apple devices. You can't simply dump an OS to an Apple device anymore and assume you're good, not with a 40% chance it's managed and going to turn into a brick. This is a huge burden for everyone in the reuse industry, and it causes many to just hit the f*** it button and scrap the stuff instead. And lastly, I gotta say, because some people will try to call me out on it, yes, there are some enterprise tools and some scripts you can run to more efficiently sniff out remote management. But most recyclers don't have those tools or those abilities, and regardless, even with those things, it's still a ridiculous amount of unnecessary work. So yeah, that was kind of a whirlwind, wasn't it? But believe it or not, what I've described just now is the best case scenario. In this scenario, you've got a recycler that knows management is a thing that exists. The recycler decides to spend money on the labor and the institution is receptive and willing to deregister. But most of the time you don't have all of that or any of that. Most of the time devices change ownership and no one has a clue. If devices aren't powered on until five recyclers or refurbishers later, it's just too late. And then they get into the hands of smaller companies or individuals or people in need in other countries. And good luck to that person when they call a big school asking to deregister an iPad. It just doesn't happen. And most likely that device is assumed stolen and the person is met with suspicion. So that's the basic rundown on Apple Remote Management Lock. This happens to literally millions of devices. Millions of devices are destroyed, or at the very least, they're unusable, simply because the management software is open-ended and doesn't force institutions to deregister. Remember, it's not meant to be a lock. It could so easily auto deregister after 90 days of no communication with the server, or in the case that a fresh OS install has been put on the machine, the OS could simply say, hey, this machine was previously managed. Do you want to continue with previous management or move forward as an independent device? A person could click new device and that machine could be free to move forward and live its best life. But instead, for some strange reason, Apple chooses to keep its broken system this way. This way that bricks millions of devices. Hmm, very odd, isn't it? So yeah, that's the problem, but what can we do about it? Well, there's not a lot, honestly. Uh, we need to make a lot of noise, for one. The recycling and reuse industries happen behind the scenes, so most people have not a clue in the world that the industries even exist, let alone that all this destruction is happening. Hopefully Right to Repair and similar campaigns will eventually cover software locks, but right now that's not their focus. I mean, the movement does have a lot on its plate, so you don't want to dilute the message by taking on every single issue at once. One option is to take matters into your own hands and fix a device yourself. It's possible in a lot of cases to change the serial number of a managed device, freeing it from managed status, that electronic leash that's around its neck. This might make a device fully functional, but legality of this approach is up for question, and it produces a device that is certainly not going to be considered legitimate by Apple, so it's not really a solution. This serial number changer from Mac Unlocks works on 2012 to 2017 MacBooks. It boots up to a USB thumb drive and lets you type in a new permanent serial number. But keep in mind, from 2018 on, when Apple implemented the T2 chip, and even more so with Apple Silicon, this changing of serial numbers is simply not possible. In the iPhone and iPad world, serial changes can happen on certain models and years, but it's tricky and there's a lot involved. This website run by Apple Tech 752 is the best place to find the tools to do that sort of thing. Personally, I don't bother because I just can't sell devices with fake serial numbers. Another approach is the bypass method. A bypass is a hack that basically lets you skip 
part of the setup process, namely the Wi-Fi login that we talked about, so that the handshake therefore doesn't occur and you end up at the desktop of the device and can use it normally. But the problem with a bypass is that a complete reset of the device undoes the bypass, leaving the user bricked and stuck months or even years later on. And another problem with this is that sometimes shady refurbishers will bypass managed devices, sell them as good, and then leave unsuspecting customers stuck a year later when they upgrade their OS or reset their machine. And like I said, Apple won't help these people. Remote management lock encourages this shady behavior because these machines can be acquired cheap, and if you sell them as good, you can make serious money. In certain respects, activation lock is very similar to remote management lock. In the case of activation lock, institutions fail to log devices out of iCloud, and so they end up locked. In both cases, you have a badly designed system that requires a manual step, which of course as humans we one way or another fail to do, and then millions of devices ultimately end up bricked and scrapped. But activation lock is far easier to spot and doesn't require constant reloading of the OS, so it doesn't demand the same labor burden and frustration as remote management lock. There's a lot of irony, really, to the fact that remote management lock is as bad or even worse than activation lock. Devices can even be activation locked and remote management locked, as I reported in this video. Oh, and before people start saying any of this has anything to do with data security, with wiping data, let me point out, most of these devices dumped to recyclers are fully wiped and restored, so there's no data security issue. There's no data from the source on these devices normally. These locks are based on serial numbers, so even wiped and restored, these locks still exist. So yeah, it's depressing, it's overwhelming, I know. Believe me, I've been dealing with it for many years as a refurbisher, and I've seen the number of salvageable devices shrink right before my eyes. I have to stress, these locks are not just some small thing affecting a few computers and frustrating silly people like me. It's important to understand the massive scope of the problem. Remote management lock, activation lock, and other related issues are actually threatening to end Apple reuse as a whole, threatening to end Apple refurbishing and even repair. It sounds dramatic, but it's true. In many cases, upwards of 50 to 70% of Apple devices coming in are bricked by remote management or activation lock. Not because they're stolen, but because of carelessness and badly designed Apple systems that are mysteriously open-ended and require institutions to take that easily forgotten manual step. On top of the software lock disaster, you have Apple parts pairing going on right now, which cryptographically ties all parts together and rejects perfectly good used parts, so refurbishers and repairers can't repair, and which turns all good used parts to trash. And then you have the fact that storage is now embedded into the board in most all Apple devices, so boards and whole devices get destroyed rather than reused, per the strict data destruction requirements of institutions and certifications. I can't go into detail on these additional issues here, it's just too much, but for more info check out my other videos. But my point is that all these problems are converging into an unstoppable force that is hard enough to even explain, let alone to do something about. Unfortunately, the entities involved won't listen to reason. The government agencies, the schools and universities, the corporations can't be bothered. Just look at all these offending institutions. They're too selfishly consumed with their immediate universe and they don't give a thought to reuse. And Apple, the primary cause of it all, doesn't really care, and it greenwashes the world into a trance. Unlike others, I don't accuse Apple of malicious intent, but just like the institutions that do these things, they are consumed with looking forward, not looking backward at the trash heap they're causing. And the recycling industry doesn't do anything about these issues, even to save itself. It's too concerned with greenwashing and appearing squeaky clean, and it doesn't speak out because it doesn't want the spotlight on itself. Because the parties involved won't listen, it's my opinion that laws and regulations are needed. Isn't that what government is for, after all? To look out for the interests of the people, to call out shady and destructive business practices? And within government, specifically the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, the agency tasked with this specifically, shouldn't it be doing something? What has the FTC done about this? 
Why not lawsuits? Why not regulation? A lot of talk, but not much action. Honestly, I doubt anyone at the FTC even knows about remote management lock. The FTC has had piles of low-hanging fruit dangling right in front of it for a decade, but it's done little more than talk, really, so I'm not very hopeful. What's worse is that the general public doesn't even know about all the waste and destruction. The people who are buying brand new Apple products don't feel the impact at all. Whether millions of devices get destroyed or not, they'll never feel it. These are the people Apple cares about most. As the first users of a device, the ones who pay full price for a device, they are given the best experience, and admittedly, Apple is the world's best company at providing the best consumer experience, a premium product, and the best support. But once those users toss the product over their shoulder and it enters the recycling and reuse universe, no one looks back to see what happened to it. No one looks in the rearview mirror. So who does feel the impact of this? Well, the environment feels it, certainly, because valuable resources are ground to dust. These devices represent the highest concentration of valuable resources on Earth, and when they're destroyed, nowhere near the full amount is recovered. Thousands of businesses that do repair and refurbishing feel it. They no longer have products to work with. As businesses, they no longer pump money into the economy and support those around them. They go out of business and go back to being employees and other companies. The millions of low-cost devices they provided to consumers cease to exist. Many of these devices are only a few years old, and they are robbed of a decade of usability. And the people who need computers are robbed of a device they could have used. I know lots of repair people around the world, and they look at us as if we're insane, seeing that we destroy enough good material on a regular basis to jumpstart their whole economies. People who can't afford a computer feel it. During COVID, the media was buzzing with alarming news that we're millions of devices short of where we need to be for all students to school at home. And uh, yeah, I was pulling my hair out back then because I was simultaneously witnessing thousands of devices getting scrapped. And I'm just one small refurbisher. When you take a few steps back and look at this whole mess, it really comes down to the fact that there is just a massive disconnect going on. In the game of rampant consumerism, people have lost touch with the consequences of their actions. Cause and effect. You know, if you trigger the cause but do not feel the effect, what's to stop you from triggering the cause continuously? Especially if it benefits you and gives you a rush. I describe these scenarios to people, and they honestly want to sympathize with what's going on, but they just can't relate from personal experience, and for all intents and purposes, I might as well be describing a science fiction plot. So that's it, really. I'm, I'm done rambling on. I mean, time will tell us what our fate is and how the world will judge us for our behavior. Personally, all I can do is keep beating the drum, keep repairing, keep spreading the word. That's all I know how to do, really. I'm not a genius. I just fear that with our momentum, with our trajectory, we may be destined to hit a wall. It may be too little too late. But on the other hand, who knows? When there's a tipping point, when public attention gets focused, sometimes things can change quickly. I mean, 130 years ago there weren't airplanes, and not much further back than that there weren't cars. 15 years ago there were no electric cars, and look at all the Teslas on the road now. Sometimes what seems like a wall can just disappear, or one can only hope. Thanks for watching.